Today we will speak about the matter of datus further. Please remember the point we made earlier that there isn't anything which isn't a datu, that everything is datus, just in the same way that there isn't anything which isn't dhamma, that there isn't anything which isn't nature. So you needn't um, be uncertain or consider it humorous or funny that this word datus refers to everything. Even length and shortness, height and shortness, um, even these are datus, the datus of longness, and the datu of shortness, the datu of tallness, and the datu of shortness. And if we consider carefully, we'll recognize that even negativeness and positiveness are datus. Positive things have an attractiveness or a pullingness to them, and negative things, there's a re repulsion or pushing away. Even this pushing and pulling are datus. So now let's consider especially those datus that are directly connected with our lives, that are connected and with and make up these bodies, these personalities. There are certain datus that we need to study and get to know in particular, and these we'll be talking about now. In these bodies, in, in the physical side of our lives, the datus, there are four main datus. The earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the wind element. And on the non-physical, non-material side, there is one datu. It's called vijnana datu, or the consciousness element. And then there is one more element which can't be classified as physical or as mental. This is the element, this is the agasa datu, akasa datu, or the element of space, the space element. So in summary, there are these six datus. The Buddha spoke of the human being being composed of these six elements. And so we'll consider the, the side of the rupa datus, the material elements, first. And you should notice that we're not specifying the material things themselves. We're not talking about matter itself. Instead, we're talking about certain properties or qualities of matter, which lead us to speak of them according in different ways or with different names. So we're not so much speaking of the matter itself, but properties that one can recognize in matter. So for example, the earth element we don't mean, for example, the soil on the ground or the material earth, but we mean the property of taking up room, of taking up area or space, of having a solidity, a hardness which takes up area. 
than when we speak of the water doctrine, we're, speci- we're focusing on the, the property or quality of pulling things together, holding things together as a unit. And so it's the essence of the water element is cohesion or cohesiveness, holding things together. This property can be seen easily that if you, if you separ- make a separation in water, it, it comes back together. If you have some water and kind of cut it with a knife, then the water comes back in to fill up the space. And then the fire element is stresses combustion, the quality of burning up, of burning up or consuming through combustion, which also focuses on temperature. And if it has sufficient heat, it can not only burn up itself or consume itself, it can burn up other things as well. Then the wind element has the property of movement, of movement such as you can see in a gas. So you can see that we're not stressing the material things themselves, whether earth, water, or whatever, but we're stressing the properties symbolized or exemplified by those material things, earth, water, fire, and wind. For example, in a chunk of meat, if you cut into a chunk of meat, you'll notice all four of these elements. First of all, there's the element of solidity. It has, it takes up area or volume and has a solidity to it. And then by cutting into it, you'll see blood and other liquids. One will notice the cohesiveness of the water element. And then it will have a certain temperature, a certain amount of heat. And lastly, there will be gases arising out of it or evaporating out of it constantly. So the element, the wind element, is also present. Even in a chunk of meat, a piece of meat, one can find all four of these elements. Or in blood, suppose you had a small cup or saucer of blood, even in that blood you can see all four elements. There's that in the blood which is thick and solid, which takes up space. And then there is its liquid, its liquidity, its cohesiveness, which holds it together. And then it has a certain amount of heat or temperature. And then all the time there are things evaporating out of it, gases arising from it. So also in a, in blood, say in a cup full of blood, one can find all four elements. So you can see that we don't take the material things themselves as the datu, but rather we take properties that can be found in material things as being the datu. Now, modern science may not do it this way. Modern science, which is pretty much physical material science will focus on matter itself as the basic element. But in the Dhamma science or the Buddhist science, we focus on the properties which can be found as found in matter. And these are what we take to be the basic elements or dhatus. And so we can say that we will take the property or quality found in matter as being the element itself, as being the datu itself. 
And in our bodies, we can find all four elements, the earth datu, water datu, fire datu, and wind datu. They can all be found here in these bodies of ours. For example, in the bones and muscle and flesh, we can see the earth element most clearly. And in the blood, saliva, and things like that, we see the water element very clearly. And then the body has its temperature, its heat, which is the fire element. And then in the various gases within the body and all the things which move, all the movements of the body, we find the wind element. One should examine the body until one is familiar with these four datus as they manifest in our bodies. So that in these, these living bodies of ours, or in any living thing, whether animals, trees, what have you, we can see certain qualities, certain properties in them. There are certain characteristics which can be observed and without great difficulty there are certain obvious characteristics and these are what have been called datus the earth datu and so on they can be readily observed in these living bodies of ours and in other living things and all together these four together collectively are called Rupa Datu, because there's a certain quality to them that we can consider to be the form or matter element. And so in living things we can see various characteristics, for example, whiteness or darkness or tallness and shortness. There are various characteristics that can be observed, such as different postures and movements, say walking, standing, sitting, and lying down. All of these characteristics that can be observed based upon the four basic elements, were, they're not directly called datus, but Collectively, they're all included within the, the term Rupa Datu because these characteristics, such as tallness and shortness, are based upon the four fundamental elements as well as the nervous system, the nerves and the nervous system, which are also things that can be observed as they function. These are all included within the term rupa datu, or form element. And even the conditions of femininity and masculinity, these characteristics can also be observed based upon the, the, base, the fundamental elements, and so they are included within rupa datu. So then the basic elements themselves, as well as the characteristics exhibited by them or the things dependent upon them, are all included within the term Rupa Datu. And so the main principle is that the four fundamental elements of earth, water, fire, and wind as long as any characteristics or qualities which can be observed in or based upon these four fundamental elements are what is meant by Rupa Datu. Next we come to what can be called Nama Datu. This is rather difficult for most people to understand. Normally the the term Nama is translated as name, 
and but that's not quite what it re- means. The word nama, although in some ways literally it means name, the meaning here is that it's something which inclines towards. It's that which inclines towards other things. So it kind of leans or inclines or even tends towards things. And the Nama Datu is specifically called Vijnana Datu. The Datu for knowing things, for experiencing things. This is called the the element of consciousness, the Vijnana Datu. So the the element that inclines towards other things in order to know and experience them. This is the Nama Datu or the Vijnana Datu. This term Vijnana Datu <coughs> is generally or is always translated as the consciousness element, but we feel that that doesn't capture its entire meaning, that the meaning of vijnana in this case, in this instance, is closer to the word mind, because the word consciousness has a much more specific and limited meaning than the word mind. And so we should probably translate it as the mind element here. Vijnana Datu is the mind element. So are the, there are the four fundamental elements, the four primary elements, and the characteristics and properties associated with them. These together make up <coughs> Rupa Datu. And then there is the Nama Datu, the mind element which knows and experiences things. Together, Rupa Datu and this Nama Datu <coughs> are the mind-body, the body-mind. And then there is one more element. It's the element necessary for the Rupa and Nama Datus to establish themselves. It's kind of funny that we would call something like this a datu because it's, it's, it refers to space, to empty space or to vacantness, vacancy. That which has nothing there, not nothingness but an emptiness or a vacancy, space. This is called the akasa datu, the akasa datu the space element, it's usually translated, or the, the element of vacancy. And this is necessary for, to create room for the other datus to establish themselves, to appear and manifest. All other things, all datus, can only appear and establish themselves through because of akasa datu, the space element. The entire solar system and universe can only manifest dependent upon akasa datu, the space element. And even your life, your bodies and minds, only appear because there is akasa datu. To put it very simply, you can only sit on these benches because they are empty. If they were filled up, you couldn't sit on them. But because of their vacancy, because of the element of space, you are free to to sit on them. So altogether there are six datus, the four physical ones, the mind element, and the element of space which is neither physical nor mental. Together these six elements 
make up what we call life. This living body, this human being is composed of these six elements. You ought to get to know them well. One ought to know and understand these dhatus the way that one knows is and is familiar with all the things that surround one in one's home. For example, in your kitchen, you've got your refrigerator, your stove. There's the furniture in the living room. There's the bathroom, the, the bedroom. We all are very familiar with all the things in our homes and know them very well. But the things that are really closest to us, we hardly know at all. The things around us and outside of us, we know intimately. But that which is closest to us, these six elements that make up our lives, we hardly know at all. So we ought to familiarize ourselves with these six elements that make up our lives until we know them as well as or even better than we know the, the rooms in our home and the furnishings, the appliances and all the other things that surround us with which we are very familiar. If we speak about knowing ourselves, about knowing thyself, we mean simply knowing the elements of the body and the mind elements and then the space element. Knowing these elements is what it means to know oneself. Now we haven't yet talked about the Asankata Dhatu. Everything we've been talking about are the Sankata Dhatus, the concocted, are the concocted elements. The elements of body, mind, and space are the concocted elements. We haven't yet talked about the most important element of all, the Asankata Dhatu. We discussed them yesterday but we haven't gone into them yet today. But to begin with, the elements, the things that are most important for us to know and experience are the basic six elements of the body, mind, and space. And so now we come to a very important stage in our study and understanding. This is where the stage where the six dhatus combine, they combine to compose themselves into what we call the khandas, the, the five khandas or the five aggregates. When, and so this is something that we must investigate further. So please listen carefully in order to hear how the six dhatus combine to form the five khandas or the five aggregates. So this, this begins through the concocting, the sankhara, the concocting of these six elements to form what is called the ayatana. The ayatana are the things that we experience in terms of the senses. So once the six elements are concocted into what we call the ayatana, this word ayatana is very difficult to translate. The most common English translations are really rather poor and don't actually convey the meaning properly. So we ask that you be patient and learn the Pali term ayatana instead of relying on inaccurate translations. The roots of this word 
means the root of this word means to to connect to relate to communicate or to contact so to make contact with something is to m- communicate with something is the essential meaning of ayatana but it's not quite so simple because when we speak of connecting or communicating we mean both the things that communicate as well as the things that are communicated with as well as the process the activity of communicating or contacting so there's the communicators the communications and the communicating or the contactors contacts and contacting these are all included in the term ayatana if you reflect on this you'll come to understand it and you'll see that this is a more useful way of explaining ayatana than the rather clumsy translations that are commonly used and so don't be surprised if we say that god is just an ayatana because in a certain special way we can communicate with god and traditionally the buddha spoke of nibbana as being an ayatana meaning something that we can communicate with something that we can experience make contact with from even specks of dust our ayatana we can make contact with them we can communicate with them so everything from the specks of dust to the highest thing whether we call it god or nibbana all of these are ayatana things through which and with which we communicate so you can see that there are the things through which we communicate the communicators and there are the things that are communicated with the communications and then there is the activity or condition of communicating so therefore we speak of the the inner ayatana the internal ayatana through which we communicate with things and then there are the external the outer ayatana which are the things communicated with and then there is the lastly ayatana means this process or this activity of communicating the sense activity of communicating between the inner ayatana and the outer ayatana so inside we have six ayatana with which to communicate with the world around us there is the eye ayatana the ear ayatana the nose ayatana the tongue ayatana the body the skin and body ayatana and the mind ayatana there are these six communicators or ayatana with which to make contact with the things out there and then there are the outer ayatana the ayatana out there with which we communicate there is the there are the forms that we communicate with through the eyes there are the sounds communicated with through the ears there is the ayatana of odors through which we communicate with the nose there are the ayatana of flavors through which we communicate with the tongue there's the ayatana of sensations of the physical sensations with which we communicate through the skin and body and then there are the the 
what are called tamaramana, the kind of mental objects or mental things that are communicated with through the mind ayatana. The mind as an ayatana communicates with kind of mental experiences or objects which are called dhamma, dhamma ramana in the Pali language. So there are these six external ayatana, the sight, the forms, sounds, odors, flavors, touches or physical sensations, and then the mental dhamma ramanas or mental objects experiences. Now another way of speaking about this communicating is to use a term from Paticca Samupada or dependent origination. This is the word depending upon. When we say that these ayatana are communicating Another way of speaking of this is they depend upon each other. For example, the eye depends on the form, and the form equally depends on the eye. This in Pali is called paticca, to depend upon or codependence. In one day, this activity of communicating between inner and outer ayatana this codependence between them happens so many times we, we can't even count them. How many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times there is this communicating of eyes with forms, of ears with sounds, and so on. It happens so much in each day of our lives that we can't even count them. Our lives are full up with this communicating activity of the ayatana. Now when we ask where these ayatana come from, we can only say that they come from the datus. The eyes, ears, nose, tongue and body are made up of the four physical datus. And then the mind ayatana comes from the mind element. And then the external forms, sounds, flavor, or odors, flavors, etc. come from the material elements. And then the mental objects, the mind element. And then for them to communicate with each other, this can only happen through the space element. For example, for the eye to communicate with a form can only happen because of the space element. So the, the six pairs of ayatana can happen only be through the six elements. The six elements combine to make the ayatana. The only difference is that each ayatana forms, although it's composed of the same elements, it performs a somewhat spe a specific function different from the others. The eye ayatana is there to receive light waves. It's sensitive to light waves. The ear ayatana is sensitive to sound waves. The nose ayatana is sensitive to the strength or quantity of volatile gases that enter the nose. The tongue ayatana is sensitive to the various oils and things and minerals on the tongue. The body ayatana is sensitive to physical touches and sensations. And the mind ayatana is sensitive to mental thoughts, feelings, experiences, and so on. This is, this is our life. This is our ordinary life, these six pairs of ayatana formed out of the six datus. And then once the ayatana begin to function, once they perform their respective duties, they lead to the appearance 
or arising of the khandas. The five khandas occur due to the activity of the ayatana, uh, through the codependence of the different ayatana, then there, then the khandas occur. So there are three stages. There's the level or stage of the datus, and these combine to form the ayatana. And then the, through the activity of the ayatana, there are the khandas or aggregates. There are these three levels. This word khanda is another term which is hard to translate into English. The basic meaning of the word khanda in a very ordinary sense simply means part, part or portion or composition, meaning the, the things that go into something. But when, we, when we're talking about Dhamma, to use the word khanda means to speak of the parts of life which are the most important. The very most important primary parts or aspects of life are called the khandas. So when we use the word khanda, we mean the five most important parts of life that are that absolutely must be understood. One of the more popular translations of this is into English is the aggregates. We're not quite sure whether this is the right word, but it's the common translation. Though some of the Tibetans like to translate this as the heaps because the word khanda in Sanskrit is skandhas and they'll often translate it as heaps. But the basic meaning is just the parts, the parts of life which are most important. We can know the khandas when the ayatanas function. When the, okay, the the I ayatana has the duty or function of making contact with forms. The ear ayatana has the function of making contact with sounds. So the inner ayatanas, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, have the duties or functions of making contact with forms, sounds, odors, tastes, touches, and mental objects, respectively. So when the inner ayatana interacts with the outer ayatana, or depends upon, when there's this codependence between the inner ayatana and the outer ayatana, such as the eye and a form, or the ear and sounds, then we say that the ayatanas are born the ayatana arise, they are born, they happen. Now in Dhamma language when we say something is born or that something happens, we mean that it, it performs its function. The thing has a name and when it performs the function proper to that name, we say that it is born it arises <coughs> or it happens. So when the the ayayatana through, de, de, through depending upon the form performs its function of communicating with that form, then you say that the the ayayatana is born. And it's in this way that we can know the five khandas. When the ayatanas perform their functions, when they are activated and perform their respective duties, then we say that the rubakanda, the rubakanda, the aggregate of form, which means the physical, the physical aggregate, the body, when the 
six ayatanas function, then we can say that the rubakanda is born, that the rubakanda happens. Now when the ayatanas are functioning, when they perform their respective duties, then there arises something new, something that we can call consciousness or the vijnana kanda, the aggregate of consciousness. So for example, when the, the eye, and there are, there are six kinds of vijnana or consciousness, they go under six names. There is eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness. These are the six forms of vijnana. So when the, say, take for example, when the eye interacts with a form, there is this codependence, the, the eye ayatana is performing its, its function, then is born eye consciousness. The, the, let's just leave it at that, eye consciousness is born. And it happens in the same way with the other ayatana and the other kinds of consciousness. So through the interacting, the functioning of the ayatana, then consciousness or vijnana kanda is born. So now we've got three things. There's the inner ayatana, the outer ayatana, and consciousness or vijnana. Now when these three things are functioning together, when these three work together, that then there ha arises something new. This is called patsa or contact. There is the inner and outer ayatanas codepending upon each other. That's rubakanda. And then there's the consciousness that arises, the six dependent on those ayatana. And this is called vijnana kanda. And so when the three work together, that is called patsa or contact. For it to be contact, the three have to be working together. There is each of the three, the inner ayatana, outer ayatana, and consciousness are functioning and they're functioning together. This is what must happen for it to be contact. Now if you're wondering what kanda is this contact or patsa, if you observe you can see for yourself that patsa is made up of two kandas. The ayatanas make up our rupa kanda and the consciousness is vijnana kanda. So patsa is made up of these two kandas working together. When patsa or contact arises, then there is a further reaction which is called vetana, vetana, or which is usually translated feeling. And this is itself a kanda. It's called vetana kanda or the aggregate of feeling. When when the Vedana Kanda arises and then it feels either pleasure or displeasure or something kind of in between towards the contact, when this Vedana is complete, then there, arise, then there arises the next Kanda that which is called sanya kanda sanya kanda this is another word that's been translated in different ways 
which has led to unnecessary complication and confusion. Some of the translations are half right and half wrong. But the, the main activity, the essential activity of sanya khanda is that of classifying. When something has been felt, so sanya depends upon vetana. When something has been felt is either pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant, then sanya classifies it. What is it? What's it called? What properties does it have? Such as tall, short, long, fat, thin, green, red, purple, whatever. This is the activity of sanya, to classify what is felt. It's felt as, as agreeable, disagreeable, or neither or uncertain whether it's disagreeable or not. And then it's classified according to what it is, what it's called, its properties. And this classification depends upon memory. But it's not the same as memory. In Thailand, Sanya Akanda is ordinarily translated as the Kanda of memory. And this, this translation is far too crude. The, the central activity of sanya is not memory. It's the classification of something based on memory. The, the distinction is important. The most common English translation of sanya is perception. And if perception means this classification according to what it is, what it's called, and what properties it has, classifying it in all ways, if that's what perception means, then it perceptions in a suitable translation. But the way perception is often used by, in say, modern psychological literature, the meaning is much more ambiguous and covers a whole range of things. And so perception probably isn't a very accurate translation, all over, although it's the popular one. Recognition might be closer, but it's hard finding the right English term here. So just remember it's that activity of classification, what it is, what it's called, what properties, qualities, characteristics it has. To make this very clear, in the moment of sanyakanda, that is where one has the clear feeling that this is positive or negative. When, when there's a clear sense of this of experience, life, whatever, being positive or being negative, that is, that is sanya, sanya kanda. One feels or regards it as being good, evil, right, wrong, male, female, up, down, in the moment of sanya kanda. The, any kind of dualistic discrimination or classification regarding things dualistically, such as right, wrong, good, bad, male, female, this occurs in the moment of sanya kanta. Once there is sanya kanta to recognize, classify, regard something as this or that, then there, re there arises thought. Thought, ideas, opinions, thinking. This is called Sankara Kanda. Sankara Kanda. When that, once there is some kind of Sanya, then the mind will think it will have ideas, it will form opinions according to that sanya. If something is 
classified this way, then the thinking will go accordingly. If the classification is another way, the thinking will go that way, according to sanya. This thinking, opinioning, idea making is called sankara kanda. So the thinking, the thoughts and ideas happen under the influence of sanya kanda. It's due to the perception, how something is perceived, that it is, that's how we think about it. If we perceive however we, the power of perception determines how we think about something. And so sankara kanda goes, happens according to the power of sanya kanda. So the activity of sankara kanda is that of concocting. This is what the word sankara means. It means the concocting or often it's translated mental formations because sankara means to be fabricating, producing, making, putting together. We prefer the translation concocting, though some prefer the word formations. But formation is a noun, sankara is more properly an activity. So it's the concocting. Once they're under the power of sanya kanda, then the mind concocts. It thinks, it proliferates, leading on to actions, to intentions, commitments, all kinds of things. So once there is sanya, these thoughts, um, intentions, commitments, actions, and all that goes on and on. And so sankara kanda is the kanda of the mind that is concocted, the kanda of the concocting of the mind. So it's called sankara kanda. Literally, kara means to make or to do and san means together. So it's a kind of making or putting together, which is very close to the word concoct, though, which means to cook together. The Thai translation of sankara is brung dang. Brung is like to cook or to mix when you mix food or cook it. And dang is to decorate, to make it look nice. So brung dang is kind of cooking and seasoning, or if you dang food, it means you season it with spices and things. So this kind of cooking, seasoning is brung dang. The English, the closest English translation might be concocting. This activity of mind is sankara kanda. So, this word sankara here has very broad meaning. It means the, the one who concocts, the one who is doing the concocting or the concoctor. And it also means the products, the results of the concocting, which are the concoctions. And then it also means the activity process um, of concocting. And so the word sankara here has a broad meaning, including the concoctor, the concoctions, and the activity of concocting. All of our problems come down to this concocting, to this sankara. If there wasn't any concocting of the mind, there wouldn't be any problem. Whether it concocts in a positive way, or a negative way, it's still concocting, it's still a problem for the mind. But if the concocting stops, to stop the concocting is peace. There is peace, there is calmness. If we take a look at the universe, we'll see that it's just filled up with the concoctors, the concoctions and the concocting. So the universe is just full up with 
Sankara Kanda, all this concocting. So please remember these three simple words, concoctor, concocted, concocting, and then you'll know everything in the universe. But sometimes this word Sankara is used in a very narrow way. For example, in Thailand, most often Sankara just means the body. People, Thai people speak of Sankara or Sankan in the Thai pronunciation, they just mean the body. So we must be careful not to end up with wrong understandings of this word. And so, in the, the ordinary Thai meaning, when, the, when Sankara ceases or quenches, that means death because they take Sankara to mean the body and when the body stops, you're dead. This, this understanding is only a little bit correct. The real meaning of when Sankara ceases, what that really means is Nibbana. It doesn't mean death. And so now we know the Rupa Kanda, Vedana Kanda, Sanya Kanda, Sankara Kanda, and Vijnana Kanda. Please remember them and study them. Because if we, if we know these things well, then we'll know the most important things in our lives. If we list these five Kandas, according to the way they occur naturally in the natural process of life, then we list them as first Rupa Kanda and then second Vijnana Kanda, then Vedana Kanda, Sanya Kanda, and Sankara Kanda. According, if we, according to practice experience in the way it happens naturally, it's Rupa Kanda, then Vijnana Kanda, then Vedana Sanya Sankara. And this is the best way to remember them in this order. However, in the scriptures, they're usually arranged in a different order. It's first Rupa Kanda, and then Vedana comes second, followed by Sanya and Sankara, and Vijnana Kanda is last. This is a list that's arranged for teaching in the classroom. So we have the classroom list and the practical list. In terms of practice and the way it happens in nature, and this we ought to remember it in the order of Rupa Kanda, Vijnana Kanda second, Sanya Sankara, or Vedana third, then Sanya and Sankara. This will be more useful. Now there are certain reasons why in the classroom list or the way it occurs in the scriptures, there are reasons why vijnana comes last as number five. One is that, <clears throat> the most obvious, is that vijnana operates many times, whereas rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara just occur one after the other. Vijnana kanda works with, after each one regarding Rupa Kanda, Vedana Kanda, Sanya Kanda, Sankara Kanda. Otherwise, we wouldn't be conscious of these other Kandas. So this is the best reason, the most obvious reason why Vijnana is traditionally listed last, because it has to function so often in regards to all the other Kandas. And there might be some other reasons, some special meanings that they were giving to the word vijnana, which we no longer know about. And so there are reasons that vijnana is listed, traditionally listed last. So now we're going to study life carefully in order to understand these five khandas. In other words, we use the five khandas to understand life. So we we separate life into five sections. These are the five khandas. The first section is the section for 
touching or depending upon the ayatana. This is called rupakanda, the section of for touching. Then there is the section of knowing. Knowing here doesn't mean knowing on the level of wisdom. It doesn't even mean knowing intellectually or knowing through thought. It just means knowing something as a as a distinct object of experience. That basic knowing of something is vijnana kanda, the section of knowing. The third section is the section of feeling, vetana kanda. The fourth section is the section of classification, sanya kanda. And then the fifth section is the section of conditioning and concocting. This is called sankhara kanda. And so we have these five kandas. First is the kanda of touching, contacting, communicating, depending on the ayatana, the, the kanda of contacting, of communicating. And then second is the kanda of knowing, to know the object. And then third, the kanda of feeling. Once it is known, then it is felt. In Thai, it's rujak and then rusik. Once it's known, it's felt or experienced. And then there's the kanda of classification, regarding it, considering it to be this or that. And then the kanda of concocting. So first there's contacting, and then knowing, then feeling, classifying, concocting. So when we talk about the five khandas, the thing is to grasp their duty, to, to catch these five basic functions or duties that are performed. Once you observe these duties, these functions, then you'll understand the five khandas. We'd like to show off Thai a little bit because all of these can be expressed in very simple terms. Um, we'll do our best to put them into simple English. Touching. Okay, the kanda of touching. The kanda of knowing. The kanda of feeling. Um, the kanda of, you could say, calling. Calling it this, calling it that. And the kanda of thinking in very simple terms, the khandas of touching or contacting, knowing, feeling, calling, and thinking. If you understand, if you observe and understand these five basic functions of life, then you'll know the five khandas. So now we come to the most important part. The five khandas come from the six ayatana. And the six ayatana come from the six datus. Then where is the self? If the khandas function naturally in their way and they merely arise out of or from the ayatana, and the, those functions of the ayatana just come from the datus, then where is the self? If we really go into the khandas, the ayatanas, and the datus, then one will see that life is not self, that everything in life is not self. So ask yourself, where is the ego? Where is the, the egoism when, when there are just these five khandas, ayatanas and datus? But before the Buddha's time, they took these khandas to be ego, to be me. 
there's the the me that contacts the world. The Rupa Khanda was taken to be ego or self. And then there's the me that knows the objects of experience. Vijnana Khanda was taken to be ego. Whether they called it the Atman, the Atta, the Purisha, the whatever. And then it's me, it's my ego that feels these things that feels pleasant and unpleasant about them. Or it's, it's me that classifies them, it's ego that <coughs> classifies, and it's me that thinks. Before the Buddha's time, each of the khandas was taken as being me, as being ego. But then the Buddha came along and he looked at all of these khandas carefully and he couldn't see that any of them could be self. And so the Buddha taught that instead of teaching that the khandas are self or ego, the Buddha taught that the khandas are anatta, not self. Genuine, real, true Buddhism and Buddhism alone teaches that the five khandas are not self. But this is taught on different levels. It's taught for people who are not very intelligent, people of medium intelligence, and people of highly developed intelligence. And so it's taught in more direct and indirect ways, suiting the intelligence of the audience. And so when you understand this principle, you'll see how the distinctions are made between Theravada Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism, and all the other yanas. There's these and those yanas. But whatever yana it may be, if it's Buddhism, if it's really, truly Buddhism, then it teaches that the five khandas are not self. This is in essence, all that Buddhism teaches, that the five khandas are anatta. So in short, once you know that the five khandas are not self, then you know every school and sect of Buddhism. So you don't have to waste any time and money going to buy shelves full of books about all the different kinds of Buddhism. To understand them all, just know that the five khandas are anatta, that these five sections of life are merely not self. But if we misunderstand, if we take one khanda or another as being atta, as being self, then something has gone wrong and there will be dukkha because of it. But if we really understand anatta, the truth of not-self, then it's not possible that we will make such a mistake. We won't think, speak, act, or anything incorrectly, and then there won't be any dukkha. This kind of understanding is not taught in the universities of the world, except as it's you go around, you won't find it taught except as some strange theory in obscure departments. It's not taught in the world's universities, but it is taught in the forest. But don't think it's the understanding of primitive people. This is the understanding which will end, which will quench all dukkha. This is what is called Buddhism. If you know the five khandas are anatta, then positiveness and negativeness will have no more influence over your mind, and then you will be free. So thank you once again for listening. We thank you for listening. We hope that you will strive to understand what we have been talking about and that you will understand Buddhism and 
be able to have Buddhism help you get free of suffering. So thank you. That's all, Daniel.